And um, my SYP was what makes a successful app. Um, so first, let's, I wanted to find success. Success to me in the mobile app market is what the developer thinks his or her app should provide to the user or what their goal in mind is. So if you take a kid who out of college learned programming as a major, made his own app and made a profit, to me that's a success. You take a multi-million dollar company that, for instance, Zynga, which is a game company, makes words with friends, all these social apps, that's a clear success. So these right here are the six apps that I have taken from a list of the top 50 grossing apps on the app market. If you probably don't know them, first one is Clash of Clans. It's a game a lot of kids play. Second's Pandora, which I hope you all know of. Poker, Angry Birds, Instagram, and Square. Um, just by a show of hands, does anybody not know what Square is? Okay, Square. Square, in my mind, is the greatest success out of all of these. Um, for that reason, I'll get to it a little bit later. But uh, just to make it clear now, Square was created in 2010 by uh, the co-founder of Twitter, uh, James Dickinson and Phil McKelvey. And he had the idea when his friend was a, uh, I want to say he was a salesperson for a catalog company, and a guy came in to him and he was about to make a sale and the guy hand, hands him a credit card and he can't make the transaction. What happens? Comes up with the idea. Obviously he's a genius. Comes up with a little card reader attached to the iPhone. Runs through an app so you can make mobile transactions on the fly. They take a 2.75% cut, but really that's nothing if you think about how fast and how mobile you can make these tr transactions. So that's Square. So where does it all begin? You start with the idea. You start with the original idea. And what's that original idea? Well, you want to solve a problem. Whether that problem's a real world problem or a problem of your own, as long as you can specify an audience and you hope that audience can grow within that problem, you're set. After that, you want to share the idea. Don't worry, no one's going to steal it. Most people will probably think you're stupid and your idea has no hope, but at the end of the day, execution is the key to everything. And as long as you can execute, you're going to learn from it, whether it fails or it's a success. So once you share it, you collect the feedback. Collecting feedback is very important. It gets more than one opinion. Whether that person is in your target audience or whether they're not, that's not a big deal because you always want to have other minds working on your idea. You revise the idea. Take that feedback in. Learn from it. Take that feedback and then just keep going around. This whole thing is a cycle. Ideas take years to develop. Most of the greatest ideas have taken multiple years, multiple prototypes, whether it's one app, one sample, it's the same thing. So let's start with the functions and design. Two apps up here, one of them is Shazam, which by a show of hands, obviously Mr. Goddard in English knows what Shazam is, cheating on quizzes. Uh, Shazam is a music identifier app. It identifies the music, and now they're growing into a market where it identifies commercials, movies, any sound, basically. They're growing. Second one's Instagram. Hopefully you all know what Instagram is. It takes photos, makes them look cool, and you share it with other people. It's almost like the Facebook of photos in a more defined sense. So let's start with Shazam. When Shazam first came out, it took two screens to get to the button where you had to press it to identify the music. It was a hit because it was the first thing that solved that problem of identifying music on the mobile app market. A Couple months later they came out with an update and it looked just like this. When you open that app it looked like this. Huge button, touch this just Shazam. Why does this matter? Because in that time period when you hear something and you want to identify it, you need to get to that button as fast as possible. Sure, this doesn't look great. When people open it up, they have no idea what it is. But it doesn't matter because that problem of hearing it immediately was huge. Instagram. 
People took control of Instagram and learned it without any tutorials. There was no saying how to do this, how to take pictures, how to filter, how to post it, how to do all this. A successful app, most of the time, will never have a tutorial. It'll be self-explained through design, functions, and just the layout and how the screens flow together. Time matters. Here we have an app called Status Board. Uh, currently it's $10 on the App Store. It just came out about, I want to say, a month ago. Um, when I say first impression, I literally mean first impression. When someone downloads an app, that logo is part of the first impression. If you have a logo that doesn't catch the eye, or it's not, you know, doesn't show what the app is about or what it can do, it's not going to be interesting to the user. When people look on the App Store, all they really see is logos and a title. After you click that logo, sure, you get the review and the pictures and all that stuff. So it really starts with the logo, the title, and then you draw the user from there. When I talk about seconds, when they click on that logo and your app opens up, if they don't like it, all it takes is one push to the home button, a couple seconds later they can download another app. That first screen that pops up, that first impression is a make or break. Really, it's, it's, it's so important that I mean, companies will spend months just trying to get the first screen to look good. So here are two apps. Uh, we see one is Scrabble with Friends and the other one is Ruzzle. Scrabble with Friends was created by Zynga back in 2010, I want to say. Um, it was huge. It was a great success. It came right after uh, Words with Friends, which was a... Uh, uh, da, da, da. Cross, not crossword, yeah, what do you call it? Nah, it was, maybe we have Scrabble, I guess. So this is a take off it, where you're given all the letters, use your finger to drag across, connect the dots to make a word. Words give you points, most points wins, and that's competing with another user. It was a huge success. They made thousands and thousands and thousands off this game. It died off within two months. Three months later, three months prior to now, Ruzzle comes out. Same exact game, same exact format, same exact target audience, and it's a huge success. Now how is that possible? How does one game die out two years ago, another game comes back and makes a ton of money? <laughs> Really, that's what my question is all about. What made a successful app, and how was Ruzzle successful? So my goal right now is to basically explain why Ruzzle was able to do this. One of it, it just looks different. It's as simple as that. People take functions, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. If you really think about it, they're all the same thing. They just look different, and they solve tiny little purposes within one's audience. So whether it's pictures, status updates, or just people you're connecting to, it's the same thing. Ruzzle created pressure. Now here we have a simple little comic and it really talks about kids. 46 out of the 50 top grossing apps are targeted towards kids. It's huge. If you want to make a successful app, I can tell you right now, you need to target it towards kids. That's another reason why Square, which I talked about earlier, was so successful because that was the first ever app to make it into the top 50 grossing that had nothing to do with kids. That was strictly a business app. And that's why, to me, it's the most successful app. Whether it doesn't make as much money as Facebook, Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, that's why it was so successful because it took one thinking of just targeting kids took a whole other step, targeted business. So what do kids really care about? Basically, in these apps we have here, all the app does is create what I like to call pressure. Kids, all about pressure, whether it's high school, middle school, all that, you talk about peer pressure. That's what apps are focusing on. So when you look at the apps, you look at Clash of Clans. Clash of Clans, you're playing with other people. 
35 out of the top 50 apps are all social interactions, whether it's through Facebook, Twitter, or other social media websites. They all have interactions with other kids. So when one kid, say, I hate to say it, but sitting in some class, he sees another kid on a phone, and he's playing a game. He says, oh, what's that game? He goes, oh, you should play it. There you go. That's how it starts. That's no advertising, no promotion. That's user to user, self-promotion, I like to call it. Company's not paying for it. They're just creating that social interaction that spreads the game. It's basically called the iPhone effect. Uh, sadly, just after finishing this project, two days ago I read an article in the Harvard Business Magazine that talked about it. Wish I could have seen it earlier. But they called it the iPhone effect for a reason. Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you are on Facebook, Twitter, any social media website? All right. All of you. See, it's, it's the new thing. It's hip, as they like to call it. Basically, all these advertising agencies and these huge companies are not starting to look at promoting their brand or their app through billboards. Um, a funny story. Basically, 50 Cent, who's a rap artist, he, uh, he invested a lot of money into a stock that made his headphones. It was a penny stock at the time. What did he do a day later? He invested, I think he bought 23% of the company. He tweeted the name of that company, buy, 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 buy. Tweeted it all day. A day later, he made around $5 million. How did he do it? Just from those tweets, he inspired all of these kids and he said, buy what, you, buy what you have, you know, as long as you have money, buy it, you'll make money as long as you sell it at the right time. And they believe them. What does this mean? Companies now are starting to target what they like to call celebrities or people of interest in promoting not just brands like Nike or you see, you know, Tiger Woods always rocking the Nike logo, but what they do, what they play activities, games, apps. That's, that's the new thing now. They're starting to get people to show off their idea or their concept. One reason why you take all these games like poker, Angry Birds, Instagram, actually all of these I should say, they all took whether it was people of interest or ideas that were interesting and they just built off them. So Angry Birds, just to go through it simply, was simple physics. It was the first of its kind. When apps first hit the App Store, they were $10 each. And you think, $10 for an app, like that's, that's a ton of money. And what, people, what developers started to realize as they went through in years past, you know, economics told them if they lowered their price and they were able to sell more, you can make more money. And when they sold more, the more volume you have, the more self-promotion, the more you know, audience sh shifting to other audiences. That really helped. That's why, again, 39 out of the top 50 apps, gro top grossing apps, are free. How is that possible? Ads and in-app purchases or subscriptions as they like to call it. Pandora is recently in a rough, rough section right now. Uh, they only charge, I think, 60 hours of free playing time, and after that, you need to subscribe. They're losing money. Why? I don't know. Maybe more big names like Google, Twitter are starting to get into the music business and they feel the pressure. Um, Clash of Clans. Clash of Clans is a game that has no advertising at all. The company that makes that game, Supercell, has another game just like it. Basically, you take a, a home and you have or a, a keep, they like to call it, and they have troops and you're like an army. And you build an army and you try to fight with other kids. And their other game that is the exact same of that is a farm game where you have a farm and you raise animals. They make, here we go, a million dollars a day. One million dollars a day and they're growing. To me, it's not as successful as Square, but it's pretty damn good. 
a million dollars a day. Now how are they able to do that? Simply just creating pressure. And that pressure was off and on because what they did was they were the first people to come to the mobile app market that introduced a new idea of playing while you're not playing I want to say. This game runs whether you're playing it or you're not playing it. So when you're playing it and you're trying to improve upon whether it's your farm or your troops and when you stop playing it those things are still running. Whether you're training troops, you're farming animals, it's running while you're not even playing it. So that pressure that they created, whether it was off and on, it gave the user a chance to decide when they want to play, which was huge. All they do is make money from in-app in, in -app purchases, whether it's buying more animals, buying more troops, I don't know what they do. But a million dollars a day, I mean, that's it's ridiculous. Um, Pandora. Pandora was, you know, obviously a big brand name in the, uh, in the market of music. Uh, they were huge. Um, companies are starting to copy them and take that music, um, I want to say, um, same genres or same um, rhythm, basically gives you music you like uh, and build off that. Um, recently, uh, when you basically, I had the idea when you take ideas, usually if you don't have an idea, you try to build off something that's already successful. Um, I said, what if you had one iPhone that had an app, you could plug it into a stereo at a party, and other people could take songs they had in their iPhone, feed it through that one iPhone so they could create almost like a, a DJ within that party. So everyone in the party could have their own selection of songs they could play through the phone. So I went down to my dad, I was like, Dad, this is huge, this is such a good idea. And uh, <laughs> next thing you know, I look on the internet, it's already there. So I was like, yeah, there you go. There's a pretty good chance when you come up with an idea, it's already going to be there. I mean, you think about how many people there are in this world, and you think about how many people are as smart or smarter than you are, there's going to be the same idea. So what do you do? You've got to rethink the idea, you've got to revise the idea. So I said, what if you took the concept of Pandora and took that concept and said, let's have one iPhone connected to the speaker. Everyone has an app that basically sums up the music they like, and that phone picks a song that everyone likes. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Well, it's not out there. So I was like, poof, that's a pretty good idea. Went down to my dad, and he said, talk to your cousin. So my cousin is a programmer, just graduated from MIT, and uh, he's making a killing right now because this is a huge market to be in. And I talked to him, and he said, that idea is probably the second greatest idea being worked on right now. So there you go. It's already out there. Multi-million dollar companies are working on it. So basically, as long as you come up with an idea and as long as you can revise it, as long as you can get the feedback, as long as you can get other people interested in it, whether it's your audience or that audience shares it with other people, you can have a successful app. Sure, it might take funding, it might take a lot of money, but at the end of the day, really, as long as you come up with the pressure in that audience to promote it without even knowing they're promoting it, you know, you can get your name out there, whether you're a developer, whether you're an app, whether you're coming up with some business app that solves a really simple problem. Sure, it may not be free. Sure, it may not target the kids. Um, right here, where is it? Uh, 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 status board. Status board's a $10 app. It makes, an, it makes a decent amount of money. Why? Just looking at it, if you walked into someone's office and they had this thing up there, I think they're pretty smart. Um, it just looks good. Visually, it shows whatever statistics you want, whether it's the stock market, whether it's how many tweets you have, whether it's what foods you ate, how many calories you're intaking. It does everything for $10. That's not that bad. And it was the first app to introduce AirPlay. Uh, the Apple TV is a product where 
you, you know, you have Netflix, you can stream stuff from your computer. This app allowed you to stream data from that app onto the TV so you can view it on monitors or a TV. First app to do it. How it took so long? No idea. So, really, when you look at these apps and you look at all the companies behind it, sure, they had millions and millions and millions of dollars. Angry Birds, for example, had $43 million after they hit the, after they hit the $1 million mark of funding. I mean, I say if I had $4 million, $43 million, I could make a successful app. And it's true. If you had $43 million and you had enough time, you could probably make it a successful app. So really, as long as you create the pressure, as long as you know your audience, as long as you take that idea, rework it, and execute it, even if the idea is already out there, like I said, Russell, same exact thing as Scramble with Friends. The next Facebook will probably be the next Facebook. All they got to do is create the pressure, make it hip, right? That's really all it is. Once, it get, once something gets old, something new will come in. And everything takes cycles, just like the ideas. So you create pressure, you have your audience, and hopefully, with a little bit of funding, a little bit of money here, and some good ideas, you can have a successful app. And that's my project. Thanks. Uh, questions. Any questions? Yeah. I was wondering if you could elaborate on this idea of pressure. I know you, you mentioned it many times, but what does it mean like psychologically? Psychologically. Um, good question. Basically, Russell and games like that. Um, say you went to, they call it the, the view or the perch up, up there, right? Where some of us hang out after school. Three months ago, kids were playing this game. You look at that game and you're like, uh, you know, I should probably get that game. I, feel in, I want to feel involved. It's almost like take it into social groups. You want to feel involved. So it's one, it's one step further of, you know, maybe gaining a new friend or improving a relationship. You just, you're connecting with someone. It's, it's almost, I hate to say it, what it really is like high school peer pressure. I mean... Clash of Clans, I mean, one kid, our John Hogan, I don't know if you know him or not, he was the first one to download that game in our school that, that I know of. And everyone was like, dude, like, you loser. Why would you play that game? Like, why would you do that? A week later, everyone was playing that game. Why? Because they first, you know, kind of laughed at Hogan, but once they saw what it was and how fun or addicting it could be, whether you're bored stiff and second term senior sitting in the library, it was fun. And you felt involved. It's that involvement. That's, that's you know, I don't want to rephrase it, but involvement and pressure kind of go hand in hand here. So you almost feel the need to be included in something or, you know, or you could take it in a whole nother way saying Square. Square created the pressure for small business to make faster transactions. I mean, uh, you could say, you know, our economy is trying to thrive off small business now. And if someone, I mean, basically the, the adapter you get for Square, everything's free. You send, an e you send an email, you give them their contact information, they'll send you out everything. Because obviously they don't care. As, as many transactions you get, it's 2.75% on their hand. I mean, I mean pressure, it's, it's, a, it's almost, it's a vague term here, but... It really, you know, sums up everything. Poker. Poker's huge. Po poker will never go away. Whether that's pressure or not, it still makes people want to feel, I want to say, you know, Mr. McGrath told me um, two weeks ago about this new thing called like a Bitcoin. It's this like, uh, you guys know about it? I'm not super familiar, but it's this new currency, I guess. That's, that's pressure in itself. I'm sure apps are going to start using that, taking advantage. They'll probably come up with gambling apps just with Bitcoins. Because I don't think the government could do anything about that. Um, yeah, 
Uh, yeah, I don't really know any other way to say it besides. Yeah. You had talked about, um, kind of based off of that, the user to user promotion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know this, this, this happened more in the kind of more in the past with, with uh, internet when the chat rooms were bigger. But do apps, in any of your research, do you find if apps kind of ser surreptitiously have people planted like to promote anything in any kind of cyberspace? You know, I, in, I, I, in like, terms of I like those conspiracy theories. In terms of people? Yeah, like, you know, like, like record labels would, you know, pay, you know, college students. So like you know when chat rooms were bigger to kind of plug albums and like if they would pay them to do it like yeah do anything kind of like yeah that. yeah uh, an example of that would be Ashton Kutcher in Twitter uh, he was the first one to hit 10 million followers and uh, there was reports that he didn't even have 10 million followers Twitter just gave him 12 million followers and basically promoted his name promoted all the girls you want to say that would follow him on Twitter and that's what happened. Um, I'm sure he had a ton of followers but whether he had that many and he was the first one to do it I don't know but there's I mean I wouldn't doubt it there's definitely a connection between Twitter and him but I mean that's I mean like I said they're just starting to do that you know they're starting to promote these things um, hopefully that answers your question yeah. So tell me about your did you talk to any app developers? Did you code any apps yourself? Have you coded apps yourself? I don't know how to program. <laughs> uh, I don't plan to learn. I think it's a lot of time that you need to commit to it. Um, I, mean, I probably should have talked about it, but I don't want to. Well, how are we doing on time? Yeah, good. Um, so basically, besides this project, uh, I made an app myself, but I hired someone to make it for me. So I was the idea guy, and they were the programmers, and I just found them on a freelance website. Um, my idea was, you take words with friends, you take all these social games, you know, they're huge, they're big, they're free, ads drive them, in-app purchases drive them. So what was next? Uh, I had the idea in stats class, I knew when I was little, something called Tangram, which is basically a some Chinese, um, square it's separated into triangles and shapes and you can configure those shapes in multiple ways to create that square so I said what if you just took pictures and you made them into shapes and you made a social game out of it so what if you were competing with other people to create a puzzle before they were hadn't been done not a bad idea let's try it so basically we kept building off that idea and saying alright what if people could take their own pictures make them into puzzles and send them to friends. Not a bad idea. Let's include it. Um, so at the end of the day, I came up with the idea of taking a game with a single multiplayer. The multiplayer would include playing puzzles with friends, you know, images, cool images that um, you could not only relate to, but were fun to solve. And you were competing with someone, so there's always that replay value. And uh, right now we're close to finishing it. Uh, it's in the, like the testing phase, you want to call it. And uh, the Armenians, as I like to call them, the people programming this thing, are uh, working hard to get it done. Um, kind of. What was your question again? <laughs> My question was, tell me about your research process. Did you talk, talk to, to any developers? developers? Have you coded yourself? All the developers that I talked to, or I tried to talk to, whether it was emailing the guys at Supercell, emailing some Zynga people, or asking my cousin's friend who developed his own app. Um, I'll, I'll explain that story. Basically, my cousin's friend took the, the zombie trend, huge trend in zombies now, uh, and he made an ice cream game. It's called Zombie Ice Cream. But it's zombie I scream, like I, and then scream like yell so it's kind of a catch catch on basically it was a game where zombies were coming out and you had to feed them ice cream to go away and uh, he taught me a lot he said um, he said ads are important he said fluctuating ads are important and he sent me to an article link which was huge for me and it basically told me don't bug people with ads you wanna you want to gain users before you gain 
profits. Because once you gain profits, you can't gain users if you bug people with ads. There's like a, you know, a trend here. So basically, the more people you get, the more users you have coming through your app, and the more money bigger companies will pay you per download to run their ads on your app. So really, it comes down to volume. And that's why you see all the games that are free. And that's, that was huge for me, talking to him about that. And uh, he gave me insight on certain ad agencies. And uh, one tried to screw him by, he basically said, all right, promote my ad 20,000 times. And they promoted him like 60,000 times. And they said it was a computer malfunction. And he had to pay for it. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, that sucks. But it's the name of the game. So that was important, too. Um, yeah. Uh, I was, well, I'm curious, um, during your research phase, um, did you look into the Android market at all? I didn't. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, solely focused on the Apple market. Um, Android market, do you have an Android phone? Uh, yeah, I have a Nexus 7. All right. Um, to me, it's, it's surely not as big as a market. Um, in terms of downloads, users, and the people that tend, there's a different, I don't want to say different audience, but more kids definitely have an iPhone than they do an Android phone. So that's what I think drives the market, and Apple, Apple has really capitalized on that. But no, I did not look into the Android market, and, or the tablet market, actually. And that's even with iPads in general, because it costs a lot more money to make a um, tablet app than it does iPhone app. That's resolution, different functions, and a whole nother, a lot more money. Clarification. Um, when you say it costs more money, do you mean for the programmer to make it or for in general? Uh, good question. Yeah, it's more, more the... Um, Programmer a little bit, but I'd say 70% of the improved cost is the person designing it. Um, because when you bring in, it has a higher, um, whether it can function better games or stuff like that, everything improves, whether it's graphics <coughs> or just programs in general taking you know, advantage of, uh, for instance, a retina display. And that's, that's big right there. Yeah. Uh, good question. So based off that, what I've learned now, I started, before I really started researching this, I was working on my app. So now that I look back on my app, all of these things I definitely didn't implement into my app because realistically I can't. I just don't have the money or the control. And the pressure that I hope to obtain would just be the simple you know, social interaction pressure. Because I've created that function for the user to take a photo and make it into a puzzle, but they have to send it to someone. So they need to find someone to send it to. And that's, that was the pressure I'm trying to build off. Is uh, hope, hopefully that person, that user, telling another user, whether it's their grandmother or their friend, to download the app so they can put the, you know, put the picture together. So that's, that's what I was trying to build off. Yeah. Quick one. You said that uh, one of your the ideas that you pitched at your cousin was the second best idea being developed right now. What's the first best idea being developed right now? Um, a new social media. Well, this is all according to him. According to him. Yeah. Well, he, he's he's pretty. Um, social media. There's a tie basically. Social media, basically the next Facebook, you want to say, and almost an improvement on Square. Um, right now he's working on an app called Handshake, which is a catalog app for um, large retail uh, conventions, I want to say. So it's, it's, on the f it's their own personalized catalog for tablet only on their iPad, which people can surf through at you know, discount prices because they're buying it on the spot there. So. An improvement on Square, 
is huge, how people can improve off that. And the other tie would be social media. So they're starting to look at, and I, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook, but they're starting to add like, what are you doing? What are you eating? What are you, what activity are you doing? So pretty soon they're gonna start getting real deep into your lifestyle. And they're gonna take that and hopefully, I mean, they, they say like suggest friends. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's really not that good right now. And my guess is they're gonna take that to the next level where they're gonna take people with pretty much the exact same interests that you have and start connecting you, whether it's in message boards, whether it's in areas, that'll be the new. So like Netflix for people? Almost, I mean. Almost like the Pandora, the Pandora of people, yeah. pretty much. It's you know, it's it's weird to say that. Um, Did Facebook suck up Foursquare? Yeah. Is that what ended up happening? Um, not really. I don't really know much about Foursquare. That's the like I remember a while ago that being the one where I'm at this place. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, yeah. pretty much like you know, like my dad would tell me, yeah. if you can't. Copy. If you can't copy them, you just buy them, yeah. right? And that's that's what they're doing now. I mean, <laughs> uh, I had I don't know. I had this idea where if you took an app that just took all the social medias and put it on one, you know, one iPhone app where you could just scroll through instead of having to push the home button and like going to the other app, you could just simply scroll to Twitter, scroll to Facebook. Scroll to that. When you wanted to friend someone, it would friend someone on all their profiles. My cousin said it was stupid. I don't know. But like I said, everyone, you know, everyone hates on your idea. Um, but yeah, uh, and when I say the next Facebook will probably be the next Facebook, someone will come around with a cooler looking, you know, interface. As long as you get the people, the kids. Yeah. And this is sort of, I was going to ask this before you mentioned that, but is Facebook beatable? Like, yeah. Do you think it's possible that another platform could come around and? Uh, definitely. I think Facebook's in a downfall right now. Uh, I mean, you look. Even I mean, not that a stock matters that much, but you know, they. Everyone talks about how they're going to make money. I really don't know how they're going to make money. Besides ads, I mean, Facebook can't live off ads. I don't think. It can't make. It can live off ads. It can't make any profits. That's what I want to say. Um. The only, I mean, Google took a shot at it. Uh, Google Plus, I think it is. Um, to me, Google Plus, huge failure. They tried to take everyone and target everyone, and you just can't do that. Um, it wasn't hip to the kids. I mean, no kid wanted to really get involved in Google Plus. Um, and, you know, it took adults, and it said it was, you know, it's kind of kiddish to adults, I want to say. It was kind of this different, uh, funky, you know, thing. Um, I'd say the, probably the most successful would be LinkedIn, at least a shot. But that's not Facebook. It's totally different. But they took one audience and they focused on one audience. They said no kids, just professionals. And they took that. Um, yeah, I think Facebook will be beaten one day. Um, it's going to take a lot of money, that's for sure. Um, money not really going into it, but just marketing it. That would be my guess. Something that looks better, takes the functions of Facebook, simplifies them, um, maybe takes a new aspect on it, um, maybe new features like, you know, not telling people what you're doing, but what maybe you're interested in, see if other people, see. I mean, oh, that whole interest thing I think will be the new, you know, I want to say tagline, but yeah, I think it's beatable. Yeah, cool.